the two chunks of scripture today. Do you guys have those? I'm not ready for them. You have any? We got others. Okay. Um, I, I have the privilege of uh, five days a week. My breakfast is is with um, little Leah, who's three, little Amen, who's four, and, and Ezekiel. Um, and, and we eat breakfast together Monday to Friday, uh, pretty much uh, without without missing any of those days. Um, I, I don't miss any of those anyhow. But um, one of the things that I've noticed um, during that time is that um, is that whatever Amen wants, who's four, Leah wants, who's three. And, and it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's something she even likes or not. Uh, Leah is notorious for not wanting to eat fruits and vegetables. Um, she just has the sixth sense about what's healthy on the plate. And she will eat everything else first and just hope for more of that to come out before she has to find a resort to eating what's fruits or vegetables or healthy. But, um, but, but I'm in. will say, I, I want my, my muffin warmed up, Mr. Peters. And Leah will say, oh, I want mine warmed up too. Uh, our men will say, um, can I have more apple slices? And Leah will say, can I have more apple slices? Even though she didn't even touch the apple slices she already had. But because Leah said, um, because Leah said, Leah's saying it just because our men said it. Because our men said it, Leah wants it, right? Um, the other day, our men made a mess when we go over, cleaned it up with their napkin. And then she said, Mr. Peters, can I have another napkin? I said, sure, sweetie. And Leah said, can I have another napkin? Her napkin sat in there untouched. And she wants a second napkin because the four-year-old said it and wanted it. The three-year-old wants it also. Um, well, we're going to talk a little bit about unity today. What we're really going to talk about today is leadership. We're going to talk about, talk about following and leading. And who are you leading and where are you leading them to? And who are you following and where are you going? I, I watched Disney Channel yesterday, um, like I do every day. Um, I'm in my house, and Disney Channel is on, and I don't know the show. It's, it's a newer show. Um, but I'm sitting there, and sitting across the table from me um, is my little pretend office is in our living room, which is where the TV is, and the girls come in at night when we're on the hall. I'm going to watch TV sometimes, and, and I'm there, and I'm working on email, or I'm working on something, I'm putting code codes, whatever it is I'm doing. And, um, and here is a first grader and a fourth grader sitting at my table watching a Disney show. And the fourth grader said, I don't like, and then named the little actress, but I'm sure called her by her, the name she has in the show. She says, I don't like her. She tries too hard. She just read, now we know who said that. She said, I don't like her because she tries to hard. Her name wrong. Fifth grader said, not fourth grader. Um, she said, I don't like her because she tries too hard. Then, that, um, that fifth grader, apparently, who was slow made, got up and, and left. And the little first grader, still remaining unnamed, the little first grader still sitting there, and, and a couple more girls come in. And, and there's a couple of girls then sit down beside the little first grader, and the show's still on. And my first grader, says, I don't like <laughs> and then the girl says, I don't like her. She tries too hard. <laughs> and then she stands up and walks out of the room. And I, I just, I did. I laughed out loud. Nobody knew what I was laughing at. I don't think there was anything funny going on in the show. I wasn't actually watching it, so I don't know. But um, I was the only one in the room laughing. That first grader heard that fifth grader say it. And, and may not have even known what it meant. But she heard it said. And so she all of a sudden had an audience where there was some older girls in there and she thought, oh, this is my chance. This is my chance to look like I know what I'm talking about. This is my chance to say something like a fifth grader would say. You know, her chance to pick up some street cred, you know? Kind of idea. Um, okay. I, was, I was thinking about street cred I have in my life. Um, I, I claim to know way more and caver. And that's about as good a street cred as I have <laughs> in my life. That's my name dropping right there when I uh, when I walk around and I name drop those two people. Um, I know what you're with. So, uh, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my street cred. But it, it's amazing that that little first grader said, she said that, I probably don't even know what it means. But if I say it, 
in front of the right group of people, they might all of a sudden look at me, and instead of looking at me as being here, maybe they'll look at me as being here. <coughs> oh, there's so much you can learn. And let's be clear. In my 20 plus years here, I have learned way from the kids in Mount Mission School than I've ever taught. The kids in Mount Mission School, probably said, I'm not really a teacher. <laughs> but a lot of it is that you can just learn so much from just watching people. Um, two passages of scripture today that I think um, most of us would think are totally unrelated. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to relate them today um, and see what we can pull from each other. Each one of them is a sermon in and of itself. Each one of them is an amazing passage of scripture. I did a sermon um, a few years ago for Christmas, and I talked about the five events in the Bible that I think have changed our lives more than any other events. And you've got to have birth of Christ. You've got, you've got to have the cross. The cross is, is number one. The cross has changed everything, right? And so you've got the birth of Christ. You've got the cross. So you've got all these different stories there. Um, and, and I put this first story in there. Even though it's a story that for most of us, we look at it and we read and we think, oh, okay, I mean, I know that story, but I think this story has probably changed our lives. It's probably affected us here at Mount Mission School um, as much as about any story um, in the Bible. This is a big story that has affected our every day. And not affected us in the same way as, as salvation. That, that's, that's next level, right? That's amazing, right? But this story has affected our every single day. Can you pull that, that passage up, please? If you don't mind, from Genesis. <laughs> this is Genesis, um, are we at 11? Genesis 11, uh, like the first nine or ten verses of that. Now the whole world, this is, this is the Tower of Babel story. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Have you ever given that a thought that there was a time? There was a time when everybody in the world spoke a single language. Where everybody in the world could understand everybody else in the world. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and they settled there. You keep on us going read the whole thing. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if it's one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. They stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, our prayer is always consistent. We want what happens in here to glorify Lord, as I speak this morning, my hope is that it's not my words, not my thoughts. I want to be filled with this. My prayer, my hope is to be a Lord instrument. And Lord, as the Lord just speak today, that your words are so great. They're so multifaceted. The same words can, can encourage one and, and convict another. The same words can, can lift up and, and teach and do so many different things. Lord, uh, your, your word has such power. I pray Lord, that your word this morning falls on hearts that are open and receptive, including mine. May your word fall on an open, receptive heart so that each one of us may hear what it is that you have. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you go back to the beginning of that and let's go through that um, a little slower this time and break it down. The whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now here's the problem. You're sitting there and you're not recognizing, most of us aren't recognizing when we read that story. This story has its foundation in sin. It has a foundation in sin because the Lord has already told the people to spread out over the whole world. He's already told them to spread out over the whole world and to fill the world. So the Lord has already told them, break up, spread out, and go and fill the whole earth. But did you see what their purpose was in this? Let's go to the next, next slide, please. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. 
Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Do you hear the selfish nature of that? Let us make a city for ourselves so that we can be what? So that we can be famous. So that we may make a name for ourselves. And the end of that, that's, that's the lack of godliness. It is not putting the focus on the Lord and what will please Him. It's putting focus on us. I want to be famous. I want to make this about me. But already in doing this, otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth and said, let's build this city because if we don't build this city, we'll be scattered out everywhere. But the Lord's already told him to scatter out everywhere. So the whole building of this city to begin with is a rebellion against the Lord. The Lord says spread out. And they said, well, let's build a city so we don't have to spread out. Let's stay together and let's do something nobody else has done so that we can be famous. And there is unity in this. You understand? Do you see the unity in this? They are united in this. But what they are united in is rebellion. There is unity, but it's unity of rebellion in this. Good, let's keep going, please. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. This verse above every verse blows me away because this is said by the Lord himself. What was their intention? They wanted to build a tower that does what? They wanted to build a city to stay together, which was rebellion against what God's asked them to do. But they wanted to build a tower that went where? The heavens. They wanted to build a tower that reaches the heavens. And so if I said to you, could we build a tower that reaches the heavens, each one of us would say, no, that, that's impossible, right? You can never build a tower that could reach the heavens. That's crazy, right? We know the heavens are up there somewhere, but our tower can never never reach them, right? Because our tower would be something physical, and the heavens something spiritual. We can, no way, it's nonsense. And we would dismiss it immediately, right? So tell me what happens when you walk by on the playground and there's a group of Parker One boys there and they say, we are going to build a tower that reaches heaven. You smile at them. You laugh at them. You remind them not to be late for brunch. Right? You, you, you just, because if you just sit there, you think that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, right? But then God didn't say that's ridiculous. Did you, did you hear what God said? This speaks to the power that you and I have as people because God's given it to us. If as one people speaking the same language, in other words, if as one people what? United. United. It speaks to the power of unity, right? If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. As you're listening to God's word, you're sitting there going, I think God just said this is something that they actually could do. Speak in the same language, united in this. And he's speaking to the power of the unity that they have in this. But remember that it's a unity in what? In rebellion. It's a unity in disobedience. They're united not, doing, not in doing something righteous. Or not in doing something good. They're, they're united in disobeying. They're united in doing something that's already against what God's asked them to do. Wouldn't it have been different maybe if they had said, let's build a tower to honor God. Let's, let's build a tower so that everybody in the world who sees our tower will know what a great God we have. It, it would have been different, right? But it wasn't that. They built the tower out of that selfish ambition concept. Out of the let's make ourselves famous. And then I, I love the, the plurality of this next statement. This is still God speaking. He says, come let us. I always find it fascinating when God uses the word us. Right? Because God didn't say, I'm going to go down. He says, let us. Us. And it's another one of these early in Genesis references that we start pulling a picture of the trip. Come let us. Right? A plurality of God kind of idea. Come let us go down and confuse their languages so they will not understand each other. <laughs> Next slide, guys. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. Have you ever stopped and thought about this? You speak Swahili. You speak Amharic. You speak 
Bristol. You speak. And we just go through, we go through the languages that we speak here, right? And, and there's different languages spoken there. I knew that would be for um, we, we have so many different languages. Have you ever thought that the reason we are here speaking different languages, we trace it back to this story? We, we have kids here that speak all these different languages, and that's amazing, that's beautiful, that's incredible. But how much frustration does that bring? How much frustration does that bring in our world that we don't have a common language? Have you ever been frustrated? Those of you that have come to, to Mountain Mission School from another country, have you ever been frustrated because you can't communicate? Have you ever been frustrated because you know what you want but you don't know how to say what you want? Those of you that are listening, have you ever been frustrated trying to figure out what somebody else is saying? It is part of our everyday lives at Mountain Mission School for every one of us. And it all traces back to this story. This story was a game changer. This story was a life changer. We speak different languages now because of the rebellion that took place in the plain of Shinar. And we don't think about that, but their unity there. And the Lord come down and said, man, they're united. They are incredibly powerful when they are united. And they're disobedient in this. And he spread them out from there. But it's the reason we speak different languages. I, I know it's, it's so funny on Hurley One. When, um, I, I'll use this as an example. And this is not a me thing. Not for a moment. When our beautiful Radit came, she didn't speak a whole lot of English. And she has improved a hundred times. It is so beautiful. Our beautiful lady came about that same time. And she didn't speak English. Um, hardly at all. And, and so neither one of them knew very much English. But that's okay. Right? And they have both just, just grown. Right? Miss um, Donor uh, will be the first one sitting here saying, I'm so proud of those girls. Right? Um, they're her table mates. They're, you know, they're in her class. That kind of stuff. And, and tell me how far they have come in months. They have come miles. But when they first came, neither one of them really spoke more than just a handful of words of English. And one of them would come in and try to tell something that they wanted. They would walk in my house and try to tell us something they wanted. And, and that frustration would be there. And then they'd just keep saying it louder. Like, my problem is I can't hear you. Really, I can hear you. I just have no idea what you're saying. Right? And so, and then what would they always do, Mrs. Peters? They would walk out and go get the other one. And you just sit there and go... Oh, that didn't help. <laughs> so, um, I know five words, you know six words. Let's see what our 11 words can do. <laughs> um, it was that kind of thing. And they would go out and Lainey would come in and she would try so hard to tell us what she wanted. And we just, oh, it broke your heart because I just don't know what she wanted, right? And so then she'd go and get Radit and Radit would come in and she would try to help us explain what Lainey wanted. And it's like, I still don't know, right? And it, it was just like, ah. Oh. And, and I'm telling you, traces back to this story into a plain in Shinar where the Lord says, I'm going to spread people out and I'm going to give them different languages. Do you see the unity in this? But I'm telling you, our frustration today is because this was a unity of rebellion. And we have frustration still today. Isn't there occasionally times admissions team where we don't accept a kid because of the language? Once in a while we're sitting there saying, boy, I our tutors are so overwhelmed. It's just so hard to bring in a kid who's that age who doesn't speak any English. And, and even opportunities to come to places like Mount Mission School is occasionally affected, even by stories like this story. Right? For those of you that, that speak English as your second language and your grades aren't what you want them to be, how frustrated are you with that? As you're sitting there saying, I'm smart enough to be an A student and my grades are B's and C's and D's. You trace it back to this story, and it's a language issue, right? Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And so what do you see in this? You see unity. You see great unity. And, and even the Lord himself recognized, as one people, they have begun to do this, that nothing they plan to do will be impossible. The Lord recognized the power in that unity, but it was a unity of rebellion in this. You understand that? Good. Uh, can you pull up our other story? We want to try to tie these two together this morning. Um, this is another really story. It's another passage. Uh, Miss Jump read the first verse of this this morning. Thank you for that, man. Um, we, we just did this. 
we just did this in what? Bible 6, Bible 7? <coughs> and they should be able to tell you the whole thing. They should be able to, to, to say it. This was our memory verse. We did, we did one week where we did the first few verses, the next week we did the next couple of verses, and then the next week we did the whole passage. And, and who is the they talking about here? Sixth grade, seventh grade, somebody? The followers. This is the early church. This is the early church. Tell me, tell me, Christians, isn't the hope that our church today models itself after that first church? And this is what we want, right? Every one of us, so if we were trying to draw up what the perfect church would look like, we would go back to this. This has been the standard from day one. The beautiful passages in, in Acts. Um, we, we use Acts as that bar that we're all trying to reach, right? Um, and you will find on church after church some reference to we are based on, we are modeled after the first century church. We are modeled after the church of Acts chapter 2. But I'm telling you, you read this passage and you will find that most churches are nowhere near what was portrayed then. This, this, is a, this is tough. For church leaders, for people in the church, when you read this right here, you, you find that we missed the mark and we missed it by a lot. But you also find a beautiful picture here that is, that is our, our mark and trying to get to. So the they in this, in this sentence, in this passage, the they is the early church. The first Christians, the first believers. This is right after the time of Pentecost, right when 3,000 were baptized and added their number, and they formed that first church, right? They devoted. Devoted means that it wasn't half-hearted. It was serious. It was straight up. It was for real. It, it was what they made their priority. Um, give me, Russ, are you in here? Give me the line. Every breath. From our second song today. I live for you, Lord. Every breath, I live for you, Lord. I now have a new line and a new song that I can't sing. And it's not because of musical talent or I wouldn't sing anything. Every breath, I live for you, Lord. That, that's a beautiful line. And I won't speak for you. I will speak for me that I don't live my every breath. I, I, would, I would love to. It would be beautiful for that to be said of me. But it's not true. Every breath I live for you, I, I live so many of my moments for me. Sure, I live, I live a lot for you. I live so many of them for me. I live so many of them. They devoted themselves. It was their priority. They were intentional about it. It was their goal. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So do you devote yourself to the apostles' teaching? That's the scripture reading. Are you in scripture? Is it something you're devoted to? Because I'm here to tell you that, that five minutes a day is not being devoted to something. Right? Are you devoted to, to reading scripture? Some of you are devoted to your basketball career. And you it's nothing for you to play three hours of basketball in a day. That, that's what being devoted to something looks like. Are you devoted to studying the scripture? Do you even listen when Mrs. Herbshaw reads it in the morning? It'd be interesting, teachers, as soon as announcements were over, just to call out a student and say, where did Mrs. Herbshaw read from us? <coughs> It's like some of us are sitting there saying, oh, I've heard this so many times, I, it's just not important to me. And therein you see where we fall so short of that first church. They were devoted to something. They were hungry. They were really hungry. Right? They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, to fellowship. And fellowship, we, um, our churches today love to talk about fellowship being when our church and some other church go bowling together, we call that a fellowship. Um, and, and we like to replace the idea of fellowship with the idea of just hanging out with other Christians. And there is some truth to that concept, but it's a much deeper, deeper, deeper word than that. Fellowship has as its very roots the idea of meeting the needs of others. 
It's not just hanging out with other people. It's hanging out with other people and meeting their needs. It's the idea of pouring into them. It's the idea of blessing them. It's the idea of helping them. It's the idea of, of I see what your need is and I'm going to step into your life as someone who loves you and try to help meet that need in your life. I'm going to try to fill you up in this. Right? They devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And that's communion. And to prayer. Are you, are you a prayer warrior? I am telling you, we have some prayer warriors on this campus. We do. We have some beautiful prayer warriors on this campus. There are, there are certain people on this campus that when I know something is going on that, that needs covered in prayer, there are some people that I reach out to because I know they're prayer warriors. Right? Everyone was filled with awe of the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. All the believers were together and had everything in common. United. Right? We're together. We had everything in common. We are devoted. We're here fighting alongside of each other. We're serving alongside each other. We're loving alongside of each other. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I, I've been in lots of churches. Tell me the last time, grown-ups, you've seen that in a church. That, that people went and sold their home, went and sold property and brought it to the church and said, I'm not saying we don't see it now, because you do occasionally. But I'm telling you, that's where this church was at. They were united, not in rebellion, they were united in, in righteousness. They had a unity of righteousness in this, right? Every day they continued to meet together. When did the early church meet? Every day. Every day. You know, churches throughout our country now have stopped going Wednesday night services because they can't get people to come. A lot of churches in our country have stopped going Sunday night services because they can't get people to come. A lot of our churches now only do a Sunday morning service because the people say, us meeting together one day a week is enough. Oh, that's enough. That's plenty. And we find that every day, they met together. Do you see the unity in that? Do you see the picture in this? And I'll and I tell you this, and I mean this in all sincerity. I really believe our church in Mount Mission School is way closer to the picture of this first century church than any church I've ever seen. We do meet together daily. We meet together for meals, to pray together, to break bread. We meet together in devotions. We meet together in worship services. We meet together in prayer time. We meet together daily. I, I, I think Mount School is way closer to this picture than any church I've ever seen. I love that idea. I love the idea that, that every morning on early one, my wife calls our children together and they jump into the work and they do devotions together. I love the idea that every school morning Ms. Herzog comes on that intercom and leads us in prayer and puts a verse or two verses out there for us to think about and pray about for us to come together I love that picture. I think Mount Mission School is way closer than, than just any church you've ever seen. It. I love that we're coming together in this. There's a beautiful unity in that. That every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, the Lord noticed the unity in the Tower of Babel story, right? He, he saw the unit. He says, if as one people working together, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. He saw that unity, but because it was a unity of rebellion, because it was a unity where they did not do what God asked them to do, they were in direct defiance of what he asked them to do, what did he do? He broke up that unity and did what? And he spread them out everywhere. And he not only spread them out across the, the, the whole world, he also confused their languages and gave them different languages. Can you imagine what a tough day that was for the, for the people of the Tower of Babel? I'd like to think that the Lord probably kept families together. But what about friends? What about neighbors? What about people that have grown up together and loved each other their whole life and now all of a sudden they'll never see each other again? That was a tough day. And so what did the Lord do? Did he bless that? No. Because the Lord is never going to bless rebellion. The Lord is not going to bless disobedience. The Lord is not going to look at you and say, I told you to do this and you will not do it, but I'm going to bless you because you're the 
disobedient. The guy showed rebellious and innocent. He's not going to bless them. But what does he do? He blesses righteousness. He saw the unity in this story. And it was a unity of righteousness. It was, let's come together to glorify the Lord. Let's come together to build up His kingdom, not our tower. Let's come together to build His community, not our city. And what does it say? <clears throat> and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being <coughs> saved. Did you get the point? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so who blessed it? The Lord blessed it. Because he saw that it was unity, but he saw that it was unity that had at its foundation righteousness. And the Lord saw that righteousness and he did what? He blessed it. And so rather than breaking it up with the Tower of Babel because it was built on disobedience, he blessed this because it was built on righteousness. Everybody got that picture? Does that make, that make sense? Is there more to this or are we done with that? Done. Good. Right, let's go ahead and turn this off here. Um, I just want to pose you one more thought before we're done. You can take that slide down so that everybody's with me, please. Thank you, guys. And as always, I don't think I don't think we say enough good about our, our friends up in the booth, and I don't even know who they are most days. It's pretty dark up there. Um, so, I don't know. There's no lights on up there, but uh, there's just movement up there. But I assume it's real people. Um, but but I do know this: that, that every Saturday night before I preach, I send my scripture that I won't put up there to the same people or my videos or whatever, and and it's up there. And it's up there the way I want it. It's up there in the version I want, and I appreciate that so much. Um, uh, another one that thank those jobs, because we only really notice those people when they mess up, right? Yeah. It, isn't that one of those kind of things that we only notice when they mess up? But um, they did a great job again today, guys. Thank you. Um, I, I want to pose a leadership idea to you real fast in closing this morning. Um, I believe this really firmly. I really believe that everybody, um, let, let's just take Mountain Mission School. Let, let's not go bigger. Let's just move for us. Right? I really believe that everybody at Mountain Mission School <coughs> has a, a role as a leader. <coughs> as well. Because I, I, I think, and I really do believe this, uh, look back to my story of Leah and Amen. Look back to my story of Salome and the first grader. Um, I really believe that everybody who's younger than you looks up to you. I really, I really do believe that. Because if you're a Parker two boy, the Parker one boys look at you and say, I cannot wait till I get to be a big boy like the Parker two boys. Now they walk up steps. Right? And they look at the Parker two boys and they say, I cannot wait to be a Parker two boy. Parker three, Parker four. The, the same holds true. Ask my Hurley one boys. Look up to those Hurley two boys. We have an incredible group of 32 of us this year. And they come down and they really bless her. They come down and help with package. They help with hair. They help with, with the babies. They help with so much. But ask the Hurley 1 girls who they look up to. They look up to the Hurley 2 girls, right? Hurley 2 girls, I know, look up to the Hurley 3 girls. It, it is that progression. It really is. And so I'm here to tell you, even if you think nobody's looking up to you, I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. You're wrong. Even if you think you're not a leader, I'm going to tell you again, you're wrong. I, I don't think that's the question. Because you are. I guarantee you. Cadence, as you walk today, your three younger siblings pay attention to what you First, second, third graders, I'm really one day look at you. And they look at Cadence and say, I don't want to be grown up like Cadence. I want to be a, uh, an older girl. I want to be a squire like Cadence. I want to be a and they look up to you rather than you think they do or not. They do. So I'm here to make this point this morning. It doesn't matter whether you believe you're a leader or not. You are. That's not the question. Can we talk what the real question is? The question is not whether you're a leader or not. You are. The question is, is where are you leading people? Where are you leading people? I'm telling you one of the scariest thoughts to me <coughs> as a teacher is the thought that there are others following in my footsteps. That there are others going the direction I tell them to go. It brings an enormous amount of pressure on you 
to pay attention to what you're doing and how you're leading when you stop and think that others are following. So where is it that you're taking? Are you a leader in the story of the Tower of Babel? Are you a leader who leads in rebellion? Are you a leader who leads in disobedience? Are you someone who's bringing people together as a foundation that's not not holy, not godly, but what it should be? Are you the thief that's teaching others to be thieves? Are you the liar that's teaching others to be liars? Are you the cheating that has others following you and cheating? paying attention? Are you setting the example by you doing what's right? So where are you leading? I think everyone has somebody to mix up. It won't be long So little Leo looks up to Mike. And he's going to, as he gets more alert and setting up and looking around, He's going to look at Maggie that's some months older than him, and he's going to look at her. And he's going to say, oh, I wish I was big like her. Oh, look what she just did. <coughs> I'm telling you, it's all in the So where are we? I hope that we're in the Because they were united in righteousness, the Lord added to their number today those who are being saved. So my message to you this morning is just watch where you're going. Watch where you're going. Because even though you may not know, there are Take that message times a year to those of us that are staff, that are teachers, that are hall parents, that are administrators. Because you have even more. So be careful where you're going. Wouldn't it be beautiful on this campus if we had a unity? someone else rather than join in. Stop. Wouldn't it be great if that's the kind of thing? It's a high call. Isn't that exactly what Christ has called us to do? He says, I'm not calling you to be like everybody else. I'm calling you to be a I'm calling you to be in the world. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray uh, because you are good. And Lord, my prayer of each of us is not that we will be the <coughs> we already are. They can say that we will watch where we're in. That each one of us will make every effort to lead people in the right direction. And Lord, that starts with us living our lives the same way. Lord, I appreciate Mr. Bowman's community meditation so much this morning. I got you. And this is such a beautiful reminder to each of us of how important communion is. Lord, that was our time each week to stop and examine ourselves to make sure that we're on the right road, to make sure we're living as we're called to live, to, to take our eyes that sometimes throughout the week tend to just go all kinds of different directions and to take our eyes and put them right back on the cross. Because, Lord, if we are leading people in any direction other than to you, Lord, then we're leading them in the wrong direction. Lord, may each one of us walk to you. And may others walk. Lord, may this campus have a unity of righteousness. And may your spirit be in this presence. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus.